Since E3 and Junichi Masuda's announcement about not being able to transfer Pokémon to Sword and Shield outside the Galar decks, I've had a great deal of mixed thoughts. While I'm sure a great deal of people, battlers, collectors, and even casual players will have reasons to want to bring Pokémon forward, and I'll get to those, how big of an impact will having to leave behind this Pokémon have on the game? The bulk of first playthroughs of a generation are confined to the regional decks because of Pokébank, Pokémon Home, isn't updated until significantly post-launch. Galar being region locked won't affect many late playthroughs either. Most people don't sit down and go, I want to use all these old Pokemon in my new game for playthroughs. What I'm getting at is that as players, we rarely move Pokemon to help us beat the story and campaign, which for the larger part of the player base is the majority of the game they will experience. The post game players are the ones being affected by this change. I consider myself a collector, breeder, casual battler, and not a shiny hunter. I have a living Dex and Pokemon as well as nearly 600 bred or caught, EV trained competitive Pokemon. For myself, Galar will offer new Pokemon to breed and train. I still have a lot to do in Ultra Sun and Moon, however, and likely will keep coming back to previous generations for movesets no longer available, such as those with Power Punch and Retaliate, which were Gen 6 TMs. Now, I will be tinfoil hatting for a moment. Why would the Pokemon Company decide to not include the entire Pokedex, Mega Evolution, Z Moves, and so on for Generation 8. As I said, most players won't see or use the majority of assets made for Pokemon outside the region decks. There are moves that I still have never seen used, that those art assets could have never existed on my game, and I would have never known. Why even program them? I feel this is the thought process that went partly into the decision. X and Y are beautiful games for the first 3D titles in the series, but they have very little post-game besides Friends Fairy Hunting, The Battle Chateau, and Mason, or that terrible looker questline. Likely when developing, the primary focus went to the models and the game itself suffered. This hurts the diehard fans for sure, but just as how the Let's Go games weren't targeted at diehard fans, but the most casual of fans, and ended up only having any post-game appeal to shiny hunters due to being horrible for battlers, Game Freak is confident that the diehard fans will buy and play the game regardless. So they made the game targeted at the more casual audience, the audience that won't have Pokemon home won't transfer anything forward, that will beat the game and put it down until they feel like returning to play through it again. Hopefully this means that the trend of a mediocre first game in each generation will be broken and will start off with true gems for once. Tinfoil hat off. Instead of guessing why they actually chose to cut the decks in half, let's look at what activities that have become popular will actually be affected for the post-game of Pokemon. Starting off, shiny hunting will not be impacted except for Masuda breeding. Granted, for those who like to keep their entire collection in one place, they will have to deal with a somewhat split collection. But since Let's Go couldn't transfer previously, this isn't an, un an unheard of circumstance. Shiny Hunters hunt what's encounterable in the game. Each game has had a plethora of unencounterable Pokemon. Shiny hunting in various generations and games has been a common place for as long as shiny hunting has existed. If anything, I expect to see at least 100 dreams hunting shiny Wulu day one. Battling will be the most impacted, however. If you haven't frequented Smogun, a site dedicated to competitive battling over the years, you can be forgiven for not knowing tiers and how Pokemon have gone up and down these tiers of competitive between generations and even within generations. Before Pokebank in Generation 6, Trevenant was a top-tier powerhouse, but has snugly found his home at PU for the rest of eternity since then. It's easy to understand how Lopunny went from being a niche PU pick to an OU staple with the introduction of Lopunite. Or Como O going from a solid UU to a fantastic OU Pokemon with a special Z crystal. It's hard to see how some Pokemon might shine with certain contenders removed from the field. I've complained about the omnipresent Primal Groudon and Kyogre always making their way to VDC and defining the field. I doubt any legendaries, barring maybe a single trio like we got in X and Y with the legendary birds, will be in the Galar decks. While well, Zacian and Zamazenta and the unknown third box legendary will likely be highly prominent, we could see far more diverse strategies in previous competitive fields because of their choice. Because of the requirement of the Pokemon being from the new generation for VGC, it all depends on what they decide to let us catch and breed in Generation 8. VGC before Ultra Sun and Moon was far different than it is now, 
fundamentally VGC players are used to having a huge chunk of power decks not being usable, either because VGC restricts with rules such as a region locked decks, or there's simply no way to catch them in the current generation. This means for battlers, VGC players won't really be affected, but the casual battling scene will be the ones most shaken up. I have teams ranging from Little Cup to Ubers, from Kanto to Alola, and the Pokemon I'm using and even the sets aren't intentionally made to be the most competitive, but for fun. Fun to use against friends in matches where there's nothing but a good time on the line. Cutting out so many Pokemon means we cut out a lot of potential fun matches we could have had with friends. Pokemon has historically pushed players to interact with each other, from trade evolution to version exclusive Pokemon to just plain battling. I mention this because I returned to Pokemon Generation 6. I bought Pokemon Y and a few weeks later Alpha Sapphire. I had quit Pokemon back when Generation 4 moved from the Game Boy Advance to Nintendo DS. The big reason was that I had played Generation 3 alone, as most of my friends had moved on from Pokemon at the time, and I had to make a choice with the little money I had on which console to continue to. With the integration of the global trade system and other features, there has been less and less reason to go and find someone and interact with them for trade evolutions, version exclusives, or just Pokemon you haven't caught or trained yet. When I returned, I had nothing but a copy of Pokemon Y in my memories. There were 721 Pokemon as of X and Y. I finished the Kalos decks in less than a month. 457 Pokemon. Thanks to GTS, Pokebank, and Wonder Trade. In a little over a year of play, I was able to obtain every single Pokemon, except Deontay. It did help a lot that I caught the year of Mythicals, of course. I couldn't use the GTS for Deontay. I'd gotten a few Mythicals from Wonder Trade, but even after several thousand trades, no Deontay. My urge to finish pushed my patience to the limit, so I went past the game's features to any trade form, giveaway, or event I could find. It's funny. I quit Pokemon because I had no one to play with, but when I returned it wasn't until I couldn't get a Pokemon that I began searching for communities. Eventually I got my Deontay. I found a community that's made these games mean more to me than they would have otherwise. Although I know my Deontay is not legitimate, it did finish my national decks. Someone who returns in Generation 8 because of the change might just play through the game, finish their decks, and put the game down, simply because they were not forced to look beyond their game potentially find more than what they were looking for. If you've listened this far, thank you. I hope Game Freak knows what they're doing and the games are stellar, bolstering the fan base and community, despite the outcry we've heard so far. I hope to see you all in Galar.